Hey everyone, did you know that there's another weapon class besides the Blade Master in Monster Hunter called Gunner? I didn't. I mean, to be fair, I didn't even know there were other weapons past Longsword. This series has been really eye-opening for me. On top of melee-focused weapons, there exists ranged weaponry including the bow, light bow gun, medium bow gun, and heavy bow gun. Today we'll be focusing on the first I listed, the bow, and seeing when the weapon appeared in the series as well as what it brought to Monster Hunter overall. You might be surprised on its impact and effectiveness, especially with the Kelby Bow a versatile and agile weapon that allows you to attack from the comfort of a safe distance. The bow brings a lot to the table, and we're going to explore that today in this history video. So buckle up lads, because we're about to explore ranged weapons in Monster Hunter for the first time on this channel. I hope you're ready, because I'm certainly not. I know nothing about this going in. I'm honestly sweating. It's hot in here. As I mentioned in previous videos, I like to take your opinions into consideration when it comes to which weapon I will cover next. If you want your weapon to be covered soon, be sure to let me know in the comments, and please consider liking and subscribing, so YouTube's algorithm will bless me in the future. I see the algorithm in my sleep and it's pulling me slower into the depths of hell like an eldritch abomination every night. I'm slowly losing my sanity. Anyway, I'm Super Rad, and this is The History of the bow. Originally released in Monster Hunter DOS, the bow was a weapon that heavily promoted skilled play, and yeah, most weapons do that, but the bow is designed with the skilled hunter in mind. It's tactical, versatile, and fast, very fast. You're going to be attacking and repositioning constantly with this bad boy, and if you get really good at it, you could be cheesing monsters easily through the various generations of Monster Hunter. For the sake of making my life and editing this easier, all Gen 2 footage will be shown through Freedom Unite. But again, the weapon has existed since DOS and made appearances in all games leading up to Generation 5. Except for Try, which made the odd decision to remove multiple weapons for that specific entry only to have them return in 3 Ultimate. First let's talk about basic mechanics and moves. Since this is a ranged weapon, you're not going to be getting up close and personal with monsters this time around. Instead you'll unsheath your weapon and press triangle to shoot out an arrow. However, if unsheathing while moving, you will automatically knock an arrow into the bow, meaning you're still technically performing a draw action, even if not attacking right away. Unlike some other ranged weapons that have limited ammo, the bow comes with unlimited arrows, meaning you'll be stocked up in any situation. Holding triangle will allow you to charge the shot to multiple levels, and each level will produce more damage against the monster. Similar to hammer, you can move around while doing this. There's an uncharged state, also known as charge level 1, then charge level 2, and finally charge level 3 for most bows. See, in Monster Hunter Freedom 2, a fourth level was added to some bows and this would continue into future generations. Keep in mind that it drains stamina, so you should be lining up your shots efficiently, otherwise you may find yourself firing off shots preemptively. Stamina management is especially crucial considering you won't be able to fully charge your attacks if your stamina is too low. Now, Circle is going to perform melee attacks, but you'll never be using this, at least as far as I can see in Generation 2 it's effectively useless, and considering you're a bow user fighting a giant monster, it's incredibly ineffective to try and utilize. For the sake of being as detailed as possible, you can combo this move by attacking two times. You can draw attack into this. But again, you'll probably never be doing this, so best to push it to the back of your mind for now. Next, the weapon has a dedicated backup maneuver when unsheathed that uses up stamina. This can be used for simple evasion, but can also be used to cancel out of a charged shot without attacking. Further on is the aiming mechanic. By holding R, you'll go into an over-the-shoulder view that produces a trajectory line that helps signify where the arrow will land if shot. By charging your shot, you'd think you'd be applying more velocity to the arrow when fired. However, it's 
seems like the trajectory line doesn't take this into account at all and your shots will follow the same trajectory regardless of the level of charge. Additionally, the time at which the arrows hit within their trajectory seems to determine how much damage will be dealt and is shown visually through the sparks that appear when colliding with the monster. This means bow users have to properly space out their attacks for optimal and efficient damage. Moving on, we have the types of shots available that vary from bow to bow. There's three main types, including scatter, rapid, and pierce. Scatter shots shoot in a horizontal line and range from two to five arrows. The closer the arrows are to the middle of the spread when fired, the more powerful they'll be. Similar to scatter, rapid fire in a vertical stack, and the arrows spread out more as they fall in their trajectory. These arrows are strongest when they are at the top of their trajectory and weaken as they fall. Finally, pierce arrows will fire a single arrow, but it will deal multiple hits upon connecting with the monster. The number of hits, arrows, and damage for these different types is dependent on the shot level assigned to the weapon, and the type of shot and the type of level is dependent on the bow and charge level they get assigned to. I know that sounded confusing, but for example, some bows might have charge level 1 and 2 be assigned to rapid level 1, and only charge level 3 will produce rapid level 2. Maybe charge level 1 is spread 1, and charge level 3 is pierce 5. One more note on the different shot types is that they can each individually range from levels 1 to 5, with 5 being the most effective. Finally, we have the weapon's other big mechanic, coatings, which are used to provide additional utility to the weapon. With one of the coatings selected while out on a hunt, the player can press triangle and circle to apply one onto their weapon. By using your arrow while it has a coating applied, it will begin to deplete the total amount of coatings you brought with you, each type having its own maximum amount to be able to be brought along. So what are the various types? We'll start with the power coating, which provides additional attack power or damage to each shot. This is effective with most of the bow types as they fire multiple arrows, and it also allows you to bring a total of 50 coats, meaning you can unload a large amount of damage throughout the hunt. Next is close range coating, which changes the distance in which optimal damage will be applied to arrows when they connect with the monster. I don't think this actually became useful until its rework in Generation 5, maybe Generation 4, so keep that in the back of your mind for now. Next are the status coatings, like poison, paralysis, or sleep. Each of these have the ability of applying their dedicated ailment to the monster. Something to note is that melee attacks don't actually expend applied coats in your pouch, meaning if you really wanted to, like really wanted to, you could melee a monster until the ailment applied and you wouldn't use up any additional coats in the process. Paint coating also exists, but there's no real reason to use this since it's very easy to bring paintballs along with you. Like very, very easy. Why would you even bring paint coatings? Something important to note about coatings is that bows would only allow you to apply specific coats, usually limiting you on your selection in some capacity. For example, maybe your bow would let you use power coating, but not paralysis or sleep coating for some reason. Finally, certain bows can be boosted by certain coatings, and this is different on a bow by bow basis. When the coating type is outlined in green, it means that applying that coating to your bow will offer a boosted effect on top of the normal ones. For example, for example, status coatings will boost their ailment effect with each hit, however this changes later on in generations and gen ultimate to simply being a damage boost. Now I know that's a lot to take in. Generation 2 added a lot with the bow, and it really is a weapon that already promoted skilled play and proper positioning, but don't think you can rest yet. It's time to move on to Generation 3 and see what was added in Monster Hunter Portable 3rd and 3 Ultimate. As I mentioned earlier, Monster Hunter Tri removed several weapons from the entry and even locked some weapons off through progression, meaning if you were a longsword main or you wanted to try the switch axe, you had to progress to a certain part of the game to be able to try them. Bow was one of the weapons that didn't make it into Tri, but it would reappear in Monster Hunter Portable 3rd with a new mechanic the arc shot. If you recall, you can take manual aim with the bow by holding R1 or the right shoulder button on the PSP. Doing so now would lead to the new arc shot mechanic. By fully charging the bow while in manual aim mode, a new indicator will present itself to the player covering a circular area of them based on how they are aiming. By continuing to hold the charge and pressing the circle button, the hunter will perform this new arc shot mechanic, which comes in three flavors, all of which do KO damage within the generation if hitting the head. First 
first is focus, which will cause multiple pellets or coconuts, there's a million names for these things, to fall onto the location from above. It's a multi-hit move and very condensed, so it's great for getting KOs. Next is wide, which is similar to focus, but spread out more. This is better for elemental damage as it can hit multiple parts of the monster's body easier. Next is blast, which effectively causes a high damage explosion within the radius. While it does also provide KO damage, it seems less effective overall in comparison to the focus or wide shots. A new coating was added to the mix as well, specifically called exhaust coating, which was used for both tiring out a monster monster and applying KO damage if connecting shots to the head. Now that's all for Monster Hunter Portable 3rd. So what did Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate bring to the table now that the bow was finally set to appear in Moga Village? Well, let me tell you. Wah! Wah! Mommy, wah! Monster Hunter is too hard! Artificial difficulty bullshit. Why does my weapon keep bouncing? This big sword is so slow. I keep triple carding to Black Diablos. Devil Joe gives me nightmares, mommy. How is it even possible to dodge that attack? I killed the monster twice and I still didn't get a ruby. This is dumb. I keep getting two-shotted. Hey, Super Rad here. G rank got you down. Can't manage those multi-monster hunts. Generally a little bitch. Is mindlessly button mashing the only thing you've ever intended to do? Well then kid, you're in luck. The Kelby bow is just for you. That's right, you could be out there fighting monsters with badass manly weapons made of your quarry's bones, scales, teeth, and fucking brain matter. But instead, you're going to use a pissant little fucking slingshot made from pissant little fucking deer that has a super annoying sound effect to boot. There's a good boy. There's a good little boy. With a simple, unbranching upgrade path that mostly uses materials from herbivores that don't even know how to put up a fight as you slaughter them. We're talking the Kelby Sting Shot into the Kelby Strong Shot into the Great Kelby Strong Shot. Even a lazy, unskilled prick like yourself will soon be taking down Alatreon without the slightest bit of skill or attention. All you have to do to be taking on quests that are meant to be difficult and engaging while expending absolutely no effort nor ever improving your skill at the game is forge yourself an armor set with Awaken and Bombardier. Want your rare drops handing to- <laughs> want your rare drops handed to your stubby Dorito stained figure? <laughs> Want your rare drops handed to your stubby Dorito stained fingers on a silver platter? Then also get high grade earplugs and destroyer. What's that? You can get all of those skills super easily on the CDS X set? Great! Now you can farm one easy monotonous quest and make all future quests just as easy and monotonous. Now here's where things get technical, so don't forget to take notes, fuckface. The great Kelby Deer Shots level 1 charge. That means to simply fire without charging the shot, dumb shit is scatter three. That means you fire five pellets forward in a 30 degree spray. That's right, you dumb, uncoordinated bastard. You don't even have to aim. With the awaken skill, and here's the real kicker, you get 350 fucking slime. Add Bombardier and you've got 420. Blaze it. And max out at 460 with Feline Pyro Meat Plus Booze. So you've got your pansy ass all geared up. What now, you ask? Just stand 10 feet away from your target and keep pressing X. That's literally it. Spam your way to victory. Look at all the pretty colors. Look at all the pretty explosions. Look at all the carves you totally earned. By some freak chance, are you not utterly soul-crushingly alone? Get three friends with the same set for maximum cheese. Watch those endgame arena quests become complete yawn fests. Rack up those guild points you definitely deserve. Be that guy who's HR 125, using a bow, and still has his fucking auto guard talisman equipped. Congratulations, you have officially killed a monster with the least amount of effort possible by exploiting the shit out of a mechanic that was already a little bit broken to begin with. Doesn't that feel great? Aren't you just really fucking happy for yourself?
Honestly, other than the Kelby bow, the only big inclusion was the introduction of slime coating, which was very limited in the types of bows that could even utilize it. It was nice for getting extra blast damage, however, as slime was incredibly overpowered in 3 Ultimate. It guarantees a slime proc, meaning you could potentially get more consistent explosions off by applying it after pushing the tolerance of slime on the monster fairly high. So using slime coating on something like the Kelby bow early on isn't very useful because this weapon already has slime, but if you find the fight has gone on for a while and the monster's tolerance to slime has risen fairly high, applying a coating may not be a bad idea. With all that out of the way, it's time to move on to Generation 4, where we'll see how aerial style moves have affected the weapon, additional mechanics added, and in generations, styles and arts. Remember how I said in the Generation 2 section that the range in which you shoot your arrows determines the amount of damage they produce? Further, that damage and range is dependent on the type of arrow being shot. This ability became known as Critical Distance, and it was made more obvious in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. Now, when landing a Critical Distance shot, the player would have their screen shake, allowing them to know that they were producing as much damage as possible. Many seem to believe this was introduced in 4th Gen, but as we all know through watching this video, that isn't the case. This is most likely due to it not being as obvious in these previous generations, but I promise you it did exist. Usually you just see larger sparks fly off of the monster, and it wasn't always discernible if your attack was at optimal range. The next inclusion is the Power Shot, which is an additional function to bows similar to the Arc Shot. In fact, this basically split bows into two main groups, those with Arc Shots and those with Power Shots. Honestly, from a glance, these seem incredibly effective, and you get two options on how to use them. Consider that you have a bow with three charge levels, and you hold your shot until charge level two. By pressing A instead of simply letting go of the shot, you will perform what's known as the power shot, and the effect of the shot will be one charge level higher than the shot you were previously about to make, unless at full charge, as it has nowhere else to go. But here's where it gets crazy. The main utility of power shots isn't simply substituting your original attack with a more powerful one. Instead, you can press A immediately after firing off a normal attack to perform an additional power shot attack. Imagine firing off a charge level 2 attack and immediately following that up with a charge level 3 attack, essentially doubling the fire rate and damage possible for the bow over time. An interesting mechanic with Seregios bows is that it turns close range coatings into power coatings and using the melee attack with the coating will produce white sharpness level modifiers. This made close range range coatings gain a lot more utility and use within this generation in comparison to Gen 2 or Gen 3. The final addition is the ability to perform an aerial melee and ranged attack. It's a bow melee attack, so it's not going to be super useful. However, since mounting was so easy in Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate, it is worth attempting to get mounts when possible. Hunters could also shoot arrows from the air as well. This was actually spammable near a ledge due to the recoil knocking you back or something. I think you could roll around to keep it happening so it could become very useful to deal mounting damage. Okay, so moving on to generations, let's take a look at the mechanical differences as well as which styles and arts are best to use for this weapon. One of the big changes is the power shot and arc shot can now be used on any bow, meaning there is no longer a divide between the two types of abilities. A player could charge up and then use their specific arc shot or instead fire off and use their power shot. There's also a new base shot type added known as heavy shot, which is very useful at breaking monster parts, and honestly became king of the meta. Maybe not in generations because of the Teostro bow, but definitely in ultimate. The heavy shots have a shorter travel distance before drop off in comparison to the other available shot types, meaning you had two options. You either got really close to the monster, bad idea, or you learned to better arc your shots to increase the travel distance. The critical distance for the shot was during drop off, so it was best to keep your distance and arc high. There's even a new coating, similar to the power coating players can apply elemental coating to improve their elemental damage, but the amount you can bring with you is low and generally ill-advised to use in a hunt unless absolutely necessary. On top of that, the functionality of power and elemental coatings is modified to come in two levels. Power coating level 1 is essentially a weaker version
version of what you had in 4U, and Power Coding Level 2 was the normal version you may be used to. Elemental also came in these two levels. Now, in the original release, Adept Style was absolutely the meta option for bow users. It was great because it offered a large amount of evasive options for the class. By properly Adept Dodging, the Hunter would be granted a max level charge right away, so keeping one's distance and then evading as the monster approached was incredibly useful. Especially when paired with heavy shots and power shots, it also doesn't produce an arc shot, so you can go straight into a power shot if desired. Once Generations Ultimate came out and Valor and Alchemy styles were introduced, there was finally a new option for bow hunters to use. Valor really walked all over Adept and became one of the de facto styles to use. You lose access to both power shots and arc shots in this mode while not in the Valor state, but building up the gauge is fairly easy thanks to the Valor sheath and sheath cancel moves. The cancel is a Valor charge shot that has two levels outside of the Valor state and three within, and it's really effective at raising the gauge and should be used often to do so. Once in Valor mode, the back dive is restored and hunters can now produce two power shots in a row instead of one. Yeah, it's bonkers. This effectively meant that the bow could now shoot three shots in succession, such as a fully charged normal shot followed by the first power shot and finally finishing with the second power shot. This second power shot is known as a regular shot, and I'll be using that terminology later on in the video. Damage output became absolutely insane for this weapon. In Gen and Gen Ultimate, bow arts were all right, but absolute readiness was generally much more useful. In Adept style, you may have brought along Haste Rain, which improved movement and charge speed, and in Generations Ultimate, you may have brought Tactical Retreat, since it worked as a dedicated evade with iframes and allowed you to quickly enter a full charge state, which did not account for distance when calculating damage. Overall though, Bo really did get the shaft in this department. Okay, I think that's all there is to say for Generation 4. Let's finally move on to Generation 5 and take a look at World, Iceborne, and Rise. Okay, the bow in World is completely reworked, like massively reworked in many areas. The biggest change is that the shot types are no longer dependent on what bow you are using, but are instead built into the multiple moves for the bow. In fact, the only difference really are what coats can be applied to which bows and the damage or element of the bows themselves. Rapid shots have been reworked to actually be a rapid input used by the player. By simply pressing R2 three times consecutively, the hunter will produce three tiers of attacks. Each of these attacks is a higher charge level when done consecutively, so it's a great way to build up your charge, but that's about it. You'll most likely be using it to build charge and then using other abilities to stay in max charge state for as long as possible. Spread shots, now known as quick shots, have been moved to the circle button, and are fairly effective if all attacks manage to land. It doesn't cost stamina to use and is very useful for stamina regen when restarting your rotation. This can be comboed into a power shot and then again into an arc shot. This is super useful for the arc shot as it's dependent on charge level, and the combo will treat it as if it's a level 3 charge. We'll get into the arc shots shortly, but power shots mostly functioned as you would expect with little changes, such as being able to use it after a rapid shot. You could do a full rapid combo and then finish off with a power shot if you wanted, but I don't think this was the meta or the strategy in any capacity. Arc shots also have been reworked in that they can be used in any charge level by pressing circle while holding down R2. Due to this, the effectiveness of the shot is now dependent on the charge level you fire it off at. It also no longer eats up a coating, but consequently will not apply status effects or be buffed in any way. Luckily, KO damage remains. Level 3 charge is a very long stream of attacks and seems to do roughly double the damage of uncharged, so it's highly advantageous to use the level 3 arc shots when possible. To clarify about these charge levels, more levels means more spiky coconut things, which means more KO, however this would get nerfed in Iceborne. This attack can be performed with or without aiming, so it's up to the hunter how specific they want to get with these. Close range coding now comes with all bows and has unlimited uses. This means there's no excuse to not use coatings at any point in time as you will always perform more damage with a coating than without. The downside with air quotes if you want to call it that is that you'll need to be closer to the monster to get the proper critical distance. So while this is more dangerous, it's necessary in order to optimize damage. There's a huge 
quality of life improvement introduced in World as well, specifically how the reticule while aiming will now show you whether or not you were within critical distance of the monster, or if you are out of range. When in critical distance, the reticle will produce a second circle around the icon. This is the tell that any shot will gain the extra damage from critical distance. Now, if you move further away, the reticle will outright tell you that you are out of range. There's another new move addition known as the Dragon Piercer attack, which is activated by pressing triangle and circle together. This attack is very powerful and also uses the applied coating. The damage is dependent on charge, so you'll get the greatest effect by, for example, charging up to the level 3 by holding R2 and then pressing triangle and circle. Just to point out though, this is effectively where the pier shot has been moved to, so it will perform multiple hits depending on the charge level. While the move may seem effective to use, it's apparently trash 90% of the time, so you probably won't be using it very often. Back diving from Generation 4 has been removed and replaced with a new move known as Charging Sidestep, which allows the hunter to quickly slide around in an inputted direction while charging their bow. Performing this evasive option comes with utility, as it will charge your bow one level each time you use it, meaning you're not going to be losing charge by evading. When at max charge, it will keep said charge level active, leading to what is effectively known as dash dancing, and knowing when to do this is crucial to efficient bow play. There's a jumping melee attack out of this you can use by pressing triangle after the side step and it produces mounting damage so it may be useful. I doubt you'd be using it much, but maybe. You can even sidestep into a wall to produce a unique aerial attack similar to how Sword and Shield has the ability to do the same thing for Helmbreaker. Moving on to Iceborne, the big slinger burst inclusion is known as Thousand Dragons and functions effectively like a powerful shotgun for condensed damage. While in manual aiming mode, you can click the right stick to activate your slinger. From here, pressing triangle and circle together will activate the attack and fire off both a normal shot and the slinger burst at the same time. Obviously damage is based on the pods you bring, so the move can be situational. And from what I understand, you're better off using your main rotation like normal and maybe using this move for something like a wake up. What really makes this move interesting, in my opinion, is how the game considers the shot mechanically. Essentially you're performing a high damage spread shot, so by applying coatings, you'll actually still get the effects of the coatings applied to all of the slinger hit. Finally, we can move on to Monster Hunter Rise and discuss the new inclusions, reworkings, and silk bind attacks for the bow in this inclusion. If you've been watching the previous videos in this series, you'd be aware that at the time, we have no real idea on whether or not there would be custom movesets, but we did know that some silk bind attacks would be switchable. Now, with the digital event, we have received confirmation that not only are there multiple silk bind moves to use that aren't shown in the demo, but you'll also be able to customize your moves to some degree. However, since this video Video is coming before the release of World. We'll be focusing mainly on the inclusions we see in the demo specifically and some we saw in the digital event. The biggest inclusion in my opinion is they seem to have brought back the secondary power shot ability known as a regular shot. Specifically after a power shot, you can perform a secondary power shot by pressing the A button a second time. Additionally, even though things like rapid shot combo from World are still included, it seems like variable shot types have marked their return. For example, the second charge level of the demo bow will produce pierce shots. In fact, a lot of the bow's uniqueness seems to be back with even power shots potentially being affected based on the bow type in regards to what shot type they'll produce. I don't know why I made that sentence so long. It's a weird decision for sure since all of the shot types were kind of worked into various different combos, and those combos make a return in this entry, mostly. Even Dragon Piercer is back, so it's particularly surprising to see pierce shots in a normal charge attack. However, it should be noted that quick shots seem to have been removed and replaced with the old school melee attack. For what reason? I have no idea. The melee attacks always sucked, and quick shot was a much more beneficial option for bow mains. Now here's a cool inclusion that probably ties into the custom moves. Arc shot has changed in the demo for Rise. Instead of producing multi-hit KO damage within a specific area, it now instead creates a buff effect for players within it. A lot of speculation was happening within the community about bow taking on a more supportive role in Monster Hunter Rise, but I think it might be safe to theorize that the bow will be able to change which type of arc shot it uses by switching out certain moves. Maybe we'll have the option for multiple area of effect buffs, or the originally damage dealing KO ability we're used to seeing from previous generations. Herculean Draw is the first of the new Silkbind abilities. It allows the hunter to evade temporarily and gives them a brief buff to attack power. I assume the move has iframes similar to the next ability we'll discuss, but I'm not completely sure, so feel free to clarify 
clarify for me in the comments. An evasive option on top of a damage boost means this ability costs two wire bugs instead of one. Focus Shot is the second ability in the demo. I don't know why they call it Focus Shot because I don't believe you shoot anything during this ability, but that doesn't mean it's useless by any means. In fact, one of the best options for bows is evasive opportunities, and Focus Shot allows the user to essentially wirefall backwards with iframes to get out of sticky situations. On top of that, the hunter ends up in the new crouch state where their stamina will begin to regenerate rapidly, making it very easy to get back into the action. Next is Aerial Aim, which was shown off recently at the digital event. I can't show my own footage for this move as we don't have access access to it in the demo, but it can be switched out with focus shot and launches the hunter into the air. While in the air, shots performed by the hunter will receive a boost of damage. I believe that's all I have for you on the bow in Generation 5 and the generations before it. If I missed anything, please consider informing me in the comments and I'll make clarifications where I can. In a way, the bow reminds me a lot of the Hunting Horn. It's a weapon that received a lot of mechanical changes throughout generations, but the biggest similarity is how it changed in world and how the Hunting Horn changed in Rise. Both weapons were heavily streamlined, the bow having most of its situational depth instead built into the combo system of every bow. While this may seem to take away from the amount of uniqueness per bow, it is nice to have all abilities at your fingertips regardless of which type of bow you decided to use. It breaks down a barrier when it comes to the selection and crafting and means that hunters gain the ability to try out a larger variety of options. With Rise bringing back unique shot types, it'll be interesting to see how that works its way into the bow crafting process. Overall, this is potentially one of the longest weapon history scripts I have ever written, and that's because this weapon was just introduced with so many mechanics and options in comparison to most other weapons out there. It's surprising really because hunters usually suggest that blade masters transition over to bow first if they want to attempt using gunner weaponry, but the bow turned out to be one of the most mechanically diverse options options I've seen so far. Anyway, that's all I have for you today in regards to the bow. If you enjoyed this video, consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. Let me know what your favorite weapon is and what weapon you want me to cover next. I'm also streaming regularly on Twitch now and our Discord is growing rapidly. Check the description if you want to join. Thanks so much for watching everyone and I'll see you in the next video.